and thanks for joining today's webcast. We are excited to have Matt Aslett as our guest presenter. Matt is Research Director for Data Management and, at, and Analytics at 451 Research. His primary area of focus is on relational and non-relational databases, data warehousing, and Hadoop. And from the MemSQL side, we have Chief Marketing Officer Gary Orenstein and Product Specialist Connor Doherty joining us for the last half of the webcast to provide a live demo and share how MemSQL fits into the IoT and multi-model picture. If you have any questions during the webcast, please enter them through the GoToWebinar question panel, and we'll have about 10 minutes to cover questions at the end of the webcast. Finally, today's presentation will be recorded, and we'll follow up with a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. And with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us uh, on today's webinar. Uh, so I'm going to kick things off here with a, just a, you know, a brief overview of uh, the Internet of Things landscape as we see it and, and talk a little bit about our kind of take on, on the data management of, of things and what, what that means and then obviously into uh, talking about where multi-model uh, databases fit into the picture uh, you know, from our perspective. Uh, just briefly before I do that, I wanted to introduce 451 Research to any of you who've not come across the, the company before. So we are an information technology research and advisory company uh, founded in 2000. Uh, we have over 200 employees, including over 100 analysts and over 1,000 clients, uh, including uh, technology and service providers, corporate advisory, finance, professional services, and IT decision makers. Uh, but perhaps the most important number on this slide, and the last one I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, is that next one, 12,500 plus. I think actually we're up to 14,000 plus uh, at this point, so we need to update the slide. But those are uh, senior IT professionals uh, that with, are within our research community. So they're not necessarily uh, clients of 451, although, although some of them are. Um, but what they are is they're practitioners, people you know using technology in their everyday, uh, their, you know in their in their job roles, who engage with us by doing surveys, taking interviews, and and participate and help shape our view of the world. And that's an increasingly important part of. Uh, you know, four, five, one researchers. A portfolio of kind of tools that we use to uh, to come to our conclusions and, and drive our research. Uh, that done, I'll, I'll get on with the, the main topic of, of conversation today, which is obviously the Internet of Things and the data management implications of the Internet of Things. Um, this uh, illustration here uh, was done uh, during, by an artist during a presentation that my colleague Brian Partridge gave at one of the events uh, that, uh, that we hosted uh, earlier this year. And I think the reason we put that, uh, this up here to, to kick things off is it's really illustrative of um, the uh, range of technologies and, and, and different implications uh, of the Internet of Things. It's clearly a wide-ranging topic. There's a number of different areas that, that you, we can go down in terms of discussing this. Um, it's so wide-ranging, in fact, we, we are actually creating a channel uh, for, for specifically to talking about the Internet of Things, and, and uh, we within the Data Platforms and Analytics channel will also you know, help contribute to that going forward. Um, so, you know, what is the Internet of Things? Well, you know, let's start off with the term itself. It was actually coined by uh, Kevin Ashton, who's a, a British technology pioneer who co-founded the Auto ID Center at, at MIT, um, which created a global standard system for RFID and, and other sensors. Um, you know what you can really think about the, the the IoT. The way to think about that is perhaps the the in, interconnected set of sensors, machines, and and smart devices designed specifically to enable the virtualization of the physical world. Um, you know those devices we see, and I'll give some uh, examples as we move forward, are being used uh, to create new value, new services, and, and new perspectives uh, through the sharing and analysis of their, you know, essentially their observations of, of the world around them. As I say, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some examples of that later on. So, you know, from 451 Research's perspective, we, we believe that nearly every type of business that exists today can employ IoT system to create cost savings and, and efficiencies or support new business models. Um, but you know, we, we do see that IoT will form the core value proposition for you know, at least some new businesses and there are some you know, particular sectors that, that perhaps you know, deserve special mention in terms of the addressable market. 
So just to go briefly through a, a few of those, obviously the, the first that, that, that we see and the first that we focus on uh, or perhaps have focused on from a 451 researcher's perspective is industrial automation. You know, we really see this as, as we say here, the roots of IoT. Uh, what we're really talking about there is organizations looking to increase the efficiency and robustness of you know things like manufacturing lines to improve performance and reduce downtime. So these, you know, these are industries that have already in, uh, um, added a lot of automation using machines and sensors and devices, and it's now about taking it that step further. Actually, internet enabling those machines and devices to uh, drive uh, better uh, insight into into performance and therefore potentially to to improve the efficiency. Uh, the other, or, or the second, or, of uh, several, uh, you know, some of the main industries we're, we're looking at is utilities, um, and this is one actually I think you know a lot of people talk about when they talk about the Internet of Things. They talk about the things, the actual devices, and, and you know, say energy uh, monitors in the home is is a key example. Um, you know, we think from our perspective those. They're interesting examples, absolutely, but actually what's more interesting is to think about the impact of those thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of devices on the energy supplier themselves, those utilities providers, and the value and the information uh, and intelligence that it gives them in order to do things like drive more efficient energy usage and, and hopefully, you know, for us as consumers, more accurate and more efficient billing as well. And, and also to do things like predictive maintenance. We see a lot of examples of that where, uh, for example, uh, in a you have a, a boiler which has already got a lot of sensors in there, but they're primarily used just to, to tell you if it's operating or not. Actually taking more advantage of those uh, to actually do things like predictive uh, maintenance and actually reduce uh, costs for both for the, the utilities provider and the, and the consumer in terms of you know, actually fixing things potentially before they go wrong. Obviously, if you think about the utility providers and the and the, the vast networks of uh, you know pipelines and delivery, um, you know vehicles and other equipment that they have involved in in their network, there's plenty of other benefits to be had there from them in terms of predictive maintenance as well, in terms of you know everything that goes into delivering uh, you know that that energy to to the consumer. Uh, another example is is retail. Um, obviously, this is a, again a, a one of the we mentioned RFID sensors earlier. So you know RFID is uh, is, is has been already employed in the retail sector, um, and again it's what we're now seeing is about organisations taking it to that next level, in, internet enabling the those sensors, um, um, and to do things like just-in-time stock keeping, again, all about operational efficiency for the, the retailer themselves, but also, again, there's potential benefits for consumers in terms of delivering contextually relevant offers, not just sweeping broad offers to, to the consumer. And uh, again, back to the ben potential benefits, well, actually, ben potential benefits for both, things like mobilized point-of-sale terminals. So for the consumer, should hopefully you know, speed your passage through that store, make for a better shopping experience, which for the retailer means you're more likely to come back, you're more likely to, to spend money another time. A uh, few more, couple of more examples. Healthcare is is obviously uh, another key example in terms of health monitoring, alerting, and that could be in terms of wearable devices or even in terms of devices actually, you know, embedded w within within uh, a person's body in terms of, you know, improved treatment or more predictive uh, uh, monitoring of 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 health um, health risks, for example. Um, also, though. You know, we see potential opportunities here within uh, hospitals uh, and other healthcare facilities. In terms of obviously, there's a lot of you know computerized equipment within those uh, in those environments. But actually, it's, you know, very very often those are you know silos within themselves. They're appliances. They're designed to do one specific thing. And obviously, if we talk about uh, you know healthcare providers wanting to make a, take a more holistic view of you know treatment they're actually looking increasingly to combine data from multiple uh, you know healthcare uh, sensors and devices uh, to get a, a more complete picture of someone's someone's health um, you know situation uh, transportation and logistics uh, again you know this is all about efficiency uh, and in terms of 
the benefits for the provider there, just-in-time manufacturing and potentially just-in-time delivery, uh, more efficiency, and it, the potential there for improved customer service as well. I think we're already seeing this. I know, you know, from my experience, we're already seeing this in terms of, you know, just having packages, you know, delivered. Uh, to the home from 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 retailers, we're now getting a better idea of, uh, thanks to just mobile devices, you know, cell phones, we had a idea of of where the driver is on that journey, and you know, the fact that it will be with, potentially with you with, within an hour rather than at some point today. Obviously, as we see the packages actually being internet enabled themselves, you get a better sense of 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 where that is, you know that that package is within within the delivery uh, and, and logistics network. And automotive obviously is, is tied in there as well, and that is another big area where we see a lot of potential use cases. Obviously, improved safety, predictive maintenance again, uh, improved fault diagnostics, and uh, potentially more accurate driving data. And, and a, a key example of this we hear a lot is is the potential for people to improve their insurance premiums by, uh, you know, their insurers. Taking, you know, reading the sensors and, and seeing how they're actually driving the car, uh, rather than just guessing how they drive the car based on you know things like their sex and their age and where they they live. Of course, you know there is a caveat to that. There is a warning: insurance premiums may go up as well and down. If you're not a particularly good driver, you may not actually particularly want that information getting out there. But that's the way we're we're going. So. You know, there's some examples of some key industries. Obviously, I said earlier we do think this has broad implications for almost all industry sectors. So, you know, as a as a, an enterprise that's considering the potential opportunities of, of uh, you know, the Internet of Things, what are the first steps? Where should you start? Um, you know, we think uh, that the important thing is to identify the internet of, of your things. Um, you know, clearly there's a broad opportunity here, but the real uh, way that companies will deliver on that opportunity is by identifying what is of value to them. Um, specifically, we think organizations should be asking themselves uh, the following questions to identify that. So firstly, are there things, devices, sensors, whatever, within your organization already uh, that would benefit from greater connectivity? Uh, things like machinery, staff wearables, or, or, or vehicles, you know, as examples we've already talked about. Secondly, uh, is the best use being made of the things that are already network uh, ready uh, and the data that cre they create? So, you know, obviously things like servers, web logs, vehicle tracking devices, a lot of uh, of uh, you know equipment already within organizations is creating data uh, so the question is how can you better harness that data and how can you better make use of it uh, within your organization and then thirdly are there things outside the organization that would benefit from from greater uh, connectivity so I'd for example you know, I talked there about you know goods that have left the where warehouse understanding where uh, you know goods are in your delivery network and, and getting operational efficiencies from that. And, and then fourthly, is there a way to reap some value from your customers, your partners, your suppliers' smart devices that, that will be mutually beneficial? So it isn't necessarily just clearly about the internet of your things, but the internet of yours and your partners and suppliers' things as well. And, and you know, we expect to see a lot of organizations partnering you know, with their suppliers and partners specifically around Internet of Things opportunities, you know, sharing the data, uh, sharing the, the, the value that can be accrued from it. However, even if the answer to, to any of, you know, those questions is yes, uh, we still think there's other things that, that need to be taken into account. Um, one of those is, you know, the what is the data of things? What are we talking about here? I mean, it's taken for, for granted that there are these things and they'll be producing a large amount of data. So, but what, what type of data and, and what can you potentially do with that data? So, from our perspective there, we think that the types of data fall into three main buckets. Um, the first is, is metrics and measures, and obviously this is the thing that the, the most people think of when they think of the Internet of Things. So this is the data that comes from the things that themselves, measuring things like temperature, humidity, acceleration, vibration, speed, video, whatever, whatever it, it might be. But it's the, it's the actual metrics and measures that, that those devices are, uh, are reporting back to the organization. 
The second uh, type, and this is one that's not talked about as often, but it is equally important, is, is transactions. Not transactions in a, you know, a traditional financial sense, but an in interaction uh, either between two machines or between uh, a system and a human being. Um, and this is in especially important because it, it, it's transactions that enable uh, users to adjust the parameters of, of a machine or a system, you know, potentially while it's in operation, but certainly, you know, out at the edge without having to go and replace that device itself. Um, and, you know, it's that has to be done via an interaction, and that has to be you know, a transaction interaction so that you know that that change has been made, therefore you know that the information that you're getting back, the data you're getting back is, uh, you know, is that adjusted data, not, the, not what was previously being produced. And thirdly, diagnostics. So um, we're really talking here about uh, data gives an insight into the overall health of the machine or the system or the process or the device. Um, and obviously that's going to be increasingly important if you're relying as an organization on an internet of, of, thing, of devices, then you want to make sure that the data you're getting back from those devices and from that, that network is accurate because you know that the network is performing properly, it's, it's healthy, and more, perhaps more importantly, you're getting alerts when there is something not right, when it's, a device is no longer functioning, or perhaps when it's not operating within normal parameters. You can take a, you know, a view on that and respond uh, accordingly uh, in order to determine the root cause. Um, so we talked about the data of things. Also, one of the phrases I used earlier was the data management of things. Um, that is a, a, a term we've used uh, in a, a report that we published last month from 451 Research, which really kind of outlines our perspective on the data management implications of the Internet of Things. That's really what we sought to, to cover in this report. Um, you know, what are the implications? How is this going to change the, the, the database landscape? Um, and so, um, you know, I've already talked about some of the findings from the report and, and, and will continue to do so. But wanted to point out that, you know, this report uh, is available. It's actually written by primarily by my colleague Jason Stamper, but with some contributions uh, from myself. As you can see there, you know, one of the key findings that, that we came to was that the Internet of Things will place unprecedented, unprecedented, sorry, demands on data storage, data processing, and analytics, and that older systems, older database systems in particular, that were built with fewer, longer-running transactions in mind, are already starting to struggle to deal. Uh, you know, with uh, the, the the implications of the data management of things. Uh, to give some sense of of you know why we we made that observation, um, you can look at you know the the database landscape uh, as it exists today and think about two things, which is the volume of data per interaction and the frequency of interaction. So. Traditional enterprise applications, obviously supported by traditional, primarily sort of relational databases, um, were really designed to, to be able to cope with, you know, a couple of transactions every few minutes at the most. Um, compare that to a sensor or smart device that's potentially generating data that needs to be handled by those backend systems in some way every millisecond. Um, you know, there's a vast fundamental gap between you know the design considerations for dealing with you know data that's produced every couple of minutes versus uh, every every millisecond um, of course we're also talking about you know if you think about volume of data very different requirements in terms of of the volume of data each individual reading from a sensor you know may actually be a very very small amount of data so again we're talking about fundamental different fundamentally different requirements for for, for dealing with that data of course, you can flip that around. Also, you know, if you think about the volume of data in total rather than the, the volume of data, you know, per per interaction, um, whilst every individual reading is a small amount of data, you know, there's hundreds, of thousands, if not if not millions, being generated every second, and so you're actually talking about a l very large volume of data that potentially needs to to, to be ingested into an organisation and obviously obviously indexed and searched and filtered and and uh, and analysed before you can uh, truly make uh, generate value from that data. 
so if you think about the, the data management of, of things landscape, um, you know, we see that there, um, you know, there, there is a variety of products and technologies that have a part to play in, in capturing, uh, processing, storing, and analyzing data from the Internet of Things. You know, right from the edge, you know, the things themselves, um, you know, all the way through to, to search and visualization, as, as I've described. Um, you know, we, what we see is that, you know, standards in this space and technology in this space are still emerging. Um, uh, but the, the key, one of the key challenges that I mentioned is actually about ingesting all this data uh, and storing and processing it. So, you know, we do think in-memory databases are going to be key. They're clearly something, you know, for historical data or large-scale data processing, something like Hadoop has a role to play. Databases of service, potentially depending on, on, on where, um, you know, the, the data is generated and where that's going to reside. Um, but the key challenge, actually, for processing data from the Internet of Things is perhaps being able to ingest, you know, not just the volume of data, as we've talked about, but actually the fact that data is going to be coming from multiple sources in multiple different formats. And that's where, you know, the, we make the link into multimodal and multimode databases and the role that they potentially have to play. And, you know, we're, we're, we're very much... You know, looking forward here uh, in terms of how we uh, expect the, the market to evolve based on you know our observations to date. But um, you know, but what we see obviously is you know the database market has been dominated for you know 40 years or, or more by the relational database model and, and of course uh, SQL. Um, most often we've seen that you know typically organisations have separate databases for operational and analytic workloads, and I think that's become so. You know, ingrained in our way of thinking. That I think you know, some of the uh, it's easy to assume that that's done for kind of architectural elegance reasons uh, or data management elegance reasons. Um, actually, you know, when you when you look back at why this was the approach that that evolved, it was to do with performance. You know, the the, the database technologies that that existed at that stage in terms of, and also the you know the, the processing and server uh, technologies that, that existed. You know. 30, 40 years ago, you know, it simply wasn't possible to handle operational and analytic databases within the same database management system. So, yeah, it's actually about performance is the key reason why, you know, traditionally the, these roles have been separated. What we're seeing, and particularly in the last sort of, I guess, three to five years, is, is the emergence of a number of new database vendors and database uh, products and, and architectures that are designed to take advantage of things like in-memory processing, advanced processing, advanced analytics capabilities, multi-core uh, multi processors, um, you know, uh, and, and other kind of physical uh, performance improvements to actually deliver combined operational and analytic processing in a single database. So that's what we mean when we talk about multi-mode databases. So we, within 451, talk about that in terms of combined operational and analytic processing. Now, in addition to that, what we've also seen, obviously, is the expansion of the database market in general. Um, you know, particularly driven by by NoSQL um, and polyglot persistence is is the concept that, that we saw that's driven a lot of the expansion there in terms of people looking to use specialist databases for specialist purposes uh, in order to to deal with multiple data models. So obviously, document stores, JSON, key value stores, wide column stores, graph databases. Now, whilst you know, there, there are some interesting opportunities and advantages to using specialist databases for specialist purposes. Uh, what we've also seen, uh, you know, more recently, perhaps say in the next, last 18 months to two years, is that, you know, companies are trying to deal with the challenge of supporting multiple databases for a single application. And just for illustrative purposes here, I've sort of illustrated as if a company was using all, all four of the NoSQL, uh, you know, database types to, to support a single application. Obviously, it's not necessarily the case, but, you know, it potentially could be. And we do definitely see examples of companies using, you know, two, three, four, even more different databases as part of a single application for different requirements. And what happens is that that obviously leads to operational complexity and actually leads to inflexibility as well, because there's a lot of interdependence within the different data stores. Um, 
and you know interdependence leads to you know potentially to to fragility um, and also you know talk about operational complexity you know if you're if you're looking to update you know, three, four different databases uh, with you know a lot of these are open source, so they're updated on a very you know regular cadence. There's a lot of challenges to actually uh, keeping the, these uh, this sort of architecture updated, um, um, you know, with the, with the latest versions and patches, etc. So one of the responses to that is the rise of you know what we, we talk about multi-model databases. So what is clear is that you know there is still a drive towards multiple data models. There are advantages to uh, you know being able to uh, deal with JSON and key value and graph uh, data models, but um, you don't necessarily want to do that you know with four different databases or however many different databases it is. And then an interesting opportunity to sub to support a combination of those various NoSQL database models in a single database. Um, you know, we've even seen that extended also to the the relational world, um, and so you know we've seen what we might call multi-model, multi-mode databases, where in particular supporting JSON and key value perhaps more than, than some of the other uh, uh, mod data model types. But in addition to SQL, and uh, but also other specialist workloads, things like geospatial, search, time series, and so you know the what we're Heading towards definitely is, you know, the evolution of databases that span multiple models from SQL to NoSQL and and, and other uh, requirements as well. So just to sum up, obviously as I said, it's a quite a brief overview. Um, you know, there's there's plenty more to go into there, and I would encourage you to to take a look at our report specifically on the data management of things. Uh, if you're you're interested in our perspective on that, there's a, there's a lot more in that report than obviously I was able to to cover today. Um, you know, what we see there's that you know companies uh, will need to invest in new data processing and analytic technologies if they are to keep up with the scale, speed, and selection of data types they need to analyze. Due to the you know the emergence of the Internet of Things, um, you know, at the moment in the area of our data platforms and analytics, clearly there's no one size fits all. There's no silver bullet. Um, we it's highly likely that uh, IoT projects will require a number of different data platforms and analytics technologies. But as we've just been talking about, um, those data platform technologies are. Uh, coalescing, and, and we do see multi-model and multi-mode products evolving to fulfill a greater spectrum uh, of the requirements uh, for for ingesting and storing and processing data from from multiple sources in, in multiple models and multiple formats. Finally, as I said, this was, you know, whilst we 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 started off that report, the data management of things report, thinking about well, what are the data management implications? Of actually, you know, driven taking a very sort of technology driven look at the internet of things and the data management implications actually many of our conclusions came down to actually things in the more to do with business processes and you know one of the things we, we do definitely uh, say is that the organizations should start to look for the internet of their things it's very you know increase very important for organizations to identify the value proposition of the Internet of Things that's specific to them and their industry and and you know the the, the specific organisation and you know this is just good advice generally for any project but I think it's definitely going to be true with the Internet of Things we're bound as we always do to see lots of failed projects and you know the technology is really interesting it's great to to play around with but you know in terms of taking uh, you know these these early proof of concepts into production, there really needs to be a sound business case for, for any new investment here. So, you know, that tied together with the internet of, of your things, it really, I think, puts you on a, a good, in a good place to take those first steps uh, into actually deploying the technology and taking advantage of that. So, uh, thanks very much for your time. Um, obviously, we've been taking questions uh, towards the end of the webinar, so happy to, to take questions then. Uh, but for now, I'll hand over to, to MemSQL, who uh, will give you a perspective on where they fit in the landscape that I've just described and, and in particular focus on more of the, perhaps the, the implementee, implementee 
sorry, <laughs> implementation details uh, uh, around um, the you know where they fit in in the uh, in the data management of things world that I've just described. So thanks very much for your time for now. Well, thanks so much, Matt, and uh, thanks everyone for listening in. Really enjoyed getting the overview of the industry and how the Internet of Things leads to requirements on the data management of things. This is Gary Ornstein with MemSQL. I wanted to move to implementing a multi-model and a multi-mode approach, which is something that we focused on at MemSQL. We found a few key principles that have helped us get there. One is the development of an in-memory database for high performance uh, and concurrency, and as well being able to sustain multiple models. Uh, there are also options inside of MemSQL to uh, retain data on disk, uh, but in-memory gives a lot of that flexibility. A distributed architecture, which helps scale across uh, resources and uh, the ability to, to do that on commodity hardware. And a relational model, as Matt mentioned, SQL has been a foundation of data processing for nearly 40 years, and we believe it's important to have that foundation of full transactional SQL, as well as native analytic support and built-in ecosystem integration. Of course, we want to harken back to the great work that 451 Research has done in, in pointing out some of the key things on the in-memory wave, uh, particularly that companies are moving away from analyzing static data uh, that can be days, weeks, or months old, and trying to get the pulse of databases and streams of data into real time. We think this is uh, this movement of data in motion and understanding data in motion is really critical. So at MemSQL, we felt the best way to accomplish many of these was to start with a SQL engine and to use memory and distributed systems to scale SQL. This allows us to retain SQL mathematics and the query language for immediate analytics. Of course, there is a small amount of upfront attention uh, with schema on write, but inclusions of multiple models like JSON uh, with the ability to alter a table online uh, with online alter tables provides tremendous flexibility for how to handle this multi-model and multi-mode world. Uh, it's important to understand there's, a, there's been such a resurgence of SQL uh, recently across big data and traditional ecosystems. It's important to understand some of the, the differences. Uh, frequently, you'll hear about SQL as a layer, uh, which is quite different from full transactional SQL which is core to so many of the popular database products uh, out today. Uh, SQL as a layer is often something that's an implementation on top of Hadoop or uh, the Hadoop distributed file system. Compared to in the full transactional SQL world, there's a core SQL engine. SQL as a layer uh, is great for analytics only, but you need full transactional SQL to do inserts and updates and deletes. And with SQL as a layer, the definition destination is the report, uh, but with full transactional SQL, the destination is an operational application to run your business. And once you have this full transactional SQL, you can then expand for multi-model coverage. Uh, document stores using JSON are very popular, uh, and then you can also, following that, do online alter tables to convert JSON to computed columns. Key value stores and their simplicity are value that's really nothing more than a two-column table. Geospatial, because today every data point has a place, and it's important to understand points, lines, and polygons, as well as to have concise queries that can merge or filter across uh, geo-aware polygons. And of course, Spark, the popular data processing framework, which is great for real-time transformations, uh, streaming, uh, and advanced analytics. Um, 451 has also had a uh, great take on what's going on with in-memory analytics and that more are employing within their organizations to look at improving business intelligence. Uh, there's a large market in targeting uh, non-developer uh, aspects of it where code is not necessarily required and that's something that's a big part of the demo that we're going to show you. And really putting rapid analytics in the hands of business users not only empowers them but frees up some of the technical resources uh, to work on uh, other challenges. So when we think about the broad use cases for both uh, multi-mode in terms of merging transactions and analytics, 
multi-model and expanding SQL to also include other uh, data types like semi-structured data with JSON, key value data. These are some of the broad use cases across IoT, which we discussed, real-time data pipelines, and predictive applications. And recently, MemSQL introduced uh, an integrated Apache Spark solution called Streamliner. And MemSQL Streamliner, inside of MemSQL, helps you manage these real-time flows, which are often associated with the Internet of Things and the various uh, devices capturing data and the need to extract that data from those devices, and frequently that's done with the message queue Kafka, uh, then to do real-time transformations of that data, because how it arrives from the device may be a little bit different on how you want that data to reside inside your database. So the real-time transformation, leveraging the uh, power of Apache Spark is a, uh, a huge asset there. And then quickly loading that data into MemSQL where you then have the ability to query as well as build full transactional applications on top of a combination of real-time and historic uh, data leading to a real-time application. Uh, we're going to take a look at a fantasy sports example. Uh, Connor, product specialist, is going to walk us through that in a second, but I just wanted to outline what we're going to show in the context of real-time streams and simulating what might be happening when you want to combine the real-time inputs with some historical inputs. So built into the uh, MemSQL Streamliner workflow are uh, test functions, which Connor will cover first, and also the ability to do custom functions, like to bring the an entire season of baseball games or an entire history of baseball into the system so that you can then compare what's going on on game day with historical data. And finally, we'll layer on uh, a real-time stream of baseball play, imagine games going on across the uh, country where the stats are being collected in real time, and you want to see what's happening with all the latest and greatest. So with that sequence of the test uh, uh, workflow, the bringing in the, uh, the flat file of historical baseball inflow, and then layering on the Kafka integration, I'm going to turn it over to Connor for a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks Gary. So like Gary said, we're going to start out with a very simple example that just gives you an idea of how Streamliner works. So the core abstraction in Streamliner is that it, it gives you the concept of a pipeline. So I'm looking at this pipeline that I created earlier called test. And to define a pipeline, you define three phases, the extract, transform, and load phase. So here in the extract phase, I'm using this special source called test. Later, we'll be using the built-in Kafka extractor. But all this test extractor does is take the data that I put into this text box and write each of those as records into, into MemSQL. For the transform phase, we're also using a built-in transformation. Uh, we're just going to be emitting this data as JSON. You can see up here that everything I've entered so far is valid JSON. And we're going to be writing it into a table called test. So this is all that you need to do to create this pipeline and get it running. So let's start it up. Now one of the really cool features about Streamliner is that you can see the, the data as it's being processed in real time. And one of the really cool features is this tracing feature, which it isn't on by default, but when you turn it on, you can see the records as they come out of each of the phases. So after the extract phase, we can see what the records look like. After the transform phase, we can see what they look like. So in this particular pipeline, you can see that they're identical because we're just emitting JSON as JSON. So it's not a terribly interesting transformation. But just uh, one brief point here to tie in with the multi-model theme, MemSQL supports JSON natively as a column type. So I'm actually able to select the records from this table by selecting on a JSON index. So that's just a side note. Again, this isn't not the most interesting pipeline. Let's look at a more interesting pipeline now. So let's suppose that you are uh, a company that is, you know, you're running a fantasy sports league or maybe you're a scouting agency or something like that, and you're trying to build a real-time event processing system. Right now you have nothing in place. All you have is your historical records. So your records might look something like this. So I'm using this example of baseball data where I have these files where you can see all the events. There are several different types of events. There's info, there's starter or start, which tells you the player that's starting. There's play, which tells you what happened. So this is a good example of uh, 
data that you might find in an Internet of Things use case where it's event-oriented data. It's they, not all events look the same. They might have different structures, so you're going to have to do some pre-processing in order to be able to get any information out of it. And it's, it's kind of missing some information that you might really want. Like for each of these plays, you want to know who the opposing pitcher is, but it doesn't actually tell you directly in this file. So I wrote a custom extractor and a custom transformer. I just compiled them on my machine. Then I, uh, I can upload them to to streamliner using the, uh, the change jar option here. And you can see that rather than using the built-in extractor and transformer, I've used my custom baseball extractor and my custom baseball transformer. So now let's start this pipeline. And uh, you can see how, oops. And so you can, now you can see that uh, I'm, I'm processing this, this semi-structured data on the fly as it's coming into MemSQL. So after the extract phase, it's just this big long string with all these characters. It's kind of hard to figure out what's going on. After the transform phase, I've split it up into an actual schema where I have the type of the event. So after doing that, I did a little bit more processing and I uh, wrote it out into several different tables. So now you can see with the, the power of SQL, I'm now able to give you in a single query every at-bat that Joe Maurer had throughout this entire season and also deduce the, the pitcher for each of those at-bats. So all I had to do was write you know, a, a, a few lines of Scala to write these transformers, and then all I do is write a SQL query, and it gives me all this information. Remember, we're getting this out of this file here where all the information is there, but it's not in a format where it's queryable. So, uh, oh yeah, and we can also compute uh, Joe Maurer made $131,000 per hit in 2013, <laughs> which seems like a lot, but I don't think I would get any, so I guess he's worth it. Okay, so now you've got your historical data into your database, but now you want to start doing real-time event processing. So you can see these pipelines that I created down at the bottom. There's start plays and subs. These are three different types of events. There's the, it gets the starters, the plays, and when a substitution occurs. So I'm just going to click into one of these here. So the really the, the cool thing about this is I'm using the exact same transformer that I was using before when I was just loading the, fi the, the static files. But now that I'm doing this dynamically, instead of using my custom extractor, I'm using the built-in Kafka extractor. I give it a Kafka host and a Kafka topic, and I'm ready to go. So these pipelines are already running, but there's not any data flowing into them right now. So I'm just going to start up this program I wrote, which, whoops, it, which, uh, which all it does is uh, stick these events into my different Kafka topics. Now you can see that there's some data flowing through these pipelines. One of the interesting things is you'll see that the different pipelines have events at different times. This is very common with event processing where certain types of events occur more at certain times of the day. So for instance, the start events occur at the beginning of a baseball game. That makes sense. The plays happen more or less continuously. The subs, you'll kind of get bursts of substitutions toward the end of a game when you know, you're changing pitchers more often or you're making defensive substitutions. And so one of the really great things about Streamliner is that you don't need to statically allocate resources for these pipelines up front. Instead, you allocate the resources for Streamliner as a whole, and then the Streamliner application can dynamically allocate resources to these pipelines. So now, I'm just going to show you one more quick example. So now we can just change this, this query that I was using before to see how, how much we paid Joe Maurer per hit in that previous season. Now this is a real-time query. All I did was change one value. We can see that so far this season, he's made one... He's, <laughs> Made $1.5 million per hit. That, that might still be the case. I'm gonna have, I would have to turn up the rate of the data generator for that to go down faster. But the point is that uh, you're able to compute these real-time aggregations. Oh, yeah, there we go. We got another hit. Uh, you're able to compute these real-time aggregations on data flowing into MemSQL in real time. You can manage each of these pipelines through a single interface. So in closing, this week, the, the example that I'm giving you with baseball is, uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not actually at the scale of like an Internet of Things case. It seems like baseball games are going on all the time, but uh, it, the data volumes here are not 
anywhere near what it would be if you were collecting data from a data center or from uh, cable boxes or any other kind of device. The nice thing about this pipeline is that each of the components is scalable. I'm writing it to Kafka, I'm processing the data with Spark, and I'm querying it with MemSQL. Each of those is a distributed system that scales out on commodity hardware, so you can grow the pipeline as wide as you like. That's the end of the demo. Great, Connor. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, if you put together that real-time pipeline in, in uh, uh, fantasy uh, baseball, you'll be on a fast path to big rewards. That's the, uh, the takeaway. But in all seriousness, we do think that the availability of fresh real-time data uh, brings a lot of value. It, it allows you to do fast queries. And, you know, in today's world, where the world is operating in real time, there is a high cost of not capturing that data in terms of other people who will be able to see uh, ahead of the game while uh, uh, you may inadvertently get stuck behind. We also think that there's a fast path to big rewards in a distributed approach using commodity hardware, uh, not necessarily having the need to deploy a big storage area network, uh, offering the potential to deploy on cloud services such as uh, Amazon or, or Azure, and really to mitigate some of the costs that have been challenging from a legacy database perspective. Um, so with that, we wanted to say thanks for joining us. There's some detail about following that uh, and then SQL. And of course, if you'd like to try some of the activity that you saw Connor uh, demonstrating earlier, you can download the community version of MemSQL which is unlimited scale, unlimited capacity, and free forever. And we certainly invite you to take a look there. Kevin, I'll turn it back to you to see if there's been any questions from the uh, field for Matt or, or MemSQL. Yeah, we actually had a couple come in when Matt, during Matt's presentation. So uh, Matt, I'll ask you uh, the first question here. So uh, this one is, where do you think multi-mode, which they, they phrase as transactions and analytics together, will have the most impact in the business uh, world? Um, well, I think, you know, where we're seeing that, I think the important caveat there, as perhaps I, I should have mentioned and, and didn't, was it's, you know, we're not necessarily still yet talking about, you know, the sort of data warehousing workloads mixed with operational workloads. But what we are seeing is, you know, organizations wanting to get, uh, you know, faster time to insight and actually wanting to analyze data in the operational database, you know, before it goes through that ETL process into uh, the data warehouse. So there's, you know, there's various uh, examples of that. I think, you know, a lot of what we see uh, at the moment in terms of real-time uh, analysis is being driven by things like, uh, you know, marketing, customer experience uh, management, customer churn analysis, you know, in terms of getting a sense of, uh, you know, not just the historical data on a customer, but also, you know, what, what they're doing now in terms of the, your engagements you know, as a vendor, you know, as a, as a provider, your engagements with them through mobile and, and web and, and, and various different sources. So I think, you know, marketing is one. Also, uh, fraud is obviously another key area in terms of, you know, real-time fraud acting in real-time to, to, to to block or, or prevent potentially fraudulent activity. So, yeah, those are, those are two of the, the key areas I think we see. But there's plenty of other uh, areas. I mean, gaming is another one in terms of, you know, if you're, uh, you know, wanting to, to get a sense of the, the leaderboard for, a, a, you know, a real-time online game, you know, you don't want to wait until that batch process is done. You want to see who's, who's, who's you know, top of the leaderboard right now. And so it's, it's that kind of uh, example. Great. Actually, I have one more question for uh, Gary and the MemSQL team, which is, uh, what if all my data does not fit in memory, or I do not want to keep the, my data in memory? Yeah, one of the things that we incorporated into MemSQL is a disk or flash-based column store uh, exactly for that reason. So with MemSQL, you actually get the ability to store data two ways. One is uh, in memory all the time, which is what we use in our row store engine, and then the other option is to store data on disk or flash and use memory as a cache, and that's part of our column store engine. So these two uh, storage engines that are built inside of MemSQL give people the full opportunity to use all different media types for their appropriate workloads. Okay, great. Thanks. That'll do it. And a uh, big thanks to Matt for, for joining the call. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined. If you have any follow-up questions, please email us at info at memsql.com or send us a tweet at memsql. And we'll be sending out a recording in the next 24 hours.